R&B, Mojis, Daddy Go Bichi Kunora, Walama Pemi, Inyana Bayalawa, Ngai Nailang, Pudri Darabar Yanu. Welcome to Gadigal Vegetable Country. My name's Annie Rhonda Dixon Grosvenor, and I'm a, a Gadigal from Sydney area, Warrain, uh, um, a traditional descendant, and I'm also a um, traditional descendant of the Vegetable people out at La Perouse, and the Darug people out west uh, around Penrith area and also of the Ewan people from the far south coast of New South Wales. So I'm um, also an elder. I've been acknowledged as an elder by my elders and my uh, community. So um, I'd like to also acknowledge the elders past, present and future. Thank you. Thank you, Annie Rhonda, uh, for the acknowledgement, for the welcome today. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this Raising Peace event. Over this weekend, uh, we're going to be discussing peaceful alternatives to war and violence, motivated by our concern about increasing militarization in Australia. On this Anzac Day weekend, we remember the true cost of war and remember all those soldiers, healers and civilians who continue to die in war. For those who don't know us, Raising Peace is an, informal, is an informal network of people and organizations that celebrate peace and the people and organizations that work for it. We promote dialogue about peace and the issues related to peace. And we hope to create positive engagement in the ongoing process of peace. And these weekends of discussions are part of that. This is our second series of talks about peace. And our weekends event runs from now uh, and then is at 2 p.m. each day over the long weekend. My name is James Cox, and I'm part of the organising group for Raising Peace. And I also represent Pacifica, which is an organisation working on research and advocacy for peace in the Pacific region. I'm talking to you from unceded Wangal or Gadigal land, and I particularly pay my respects to the past elders of their two clans, who were among the first to feel the force of colonisation. And of course, I pay my respects and give thanks to Annie Rhonda Dixon Grosvenor and the elders of today. It's now an established practice of Raising Peace that we begin our peace festivals with the First Nations Day. Last year, we filled the day with four incredible panels. And today we have an outstanding set of panelists who are going to both confront and I hope inspire us. Anya Rhonda will lead off with an insight into life as a descendant of those who first experienced the violence of colonization. And she offers her vision of how we can move forward together. We're also going to learn about the frontier massacres and then the experience of violence against First Nations people from the perspectives of the South Sea Islanders and coloured diggers before ending with a reminder of Australia's biggest hope for reconciliation, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The panellists may have a yarn amongst themselves as we go along. And I invite you to, to contribute your own questions in the chat, which we will gather and then address at the end. Um, Today's conversation should run actually for about 90 minutes. Uh, we might run a little bit over time, forgive us if we do. But we also invite you, if you wish to, to stay around afterwards. Um, we can't offer tea and biscuits as we could if, if we were in person, but we can gather on the Zoom link to have a more informal chat afterwards. And indeed, if you need a break from the conversation, we've, uh, we're going to create a breakout room, a tea room, where you can just pop in and uh, um, and, and just escape from, from the conversation for a bit. Um, but for now, I would like to, us to return to um, Andy Ronda Dixon. Andy, Rod, Andy Ronda is a 71 year old, I think, um, Gadigal, Bidjigal, Ewan elder and traditional uh, descendant from uh, the Sydney and Saltwater Basin, as she's told us. She's the daughter of First Nations, Uni First Nations and Union activist and advocate, Dr. Charles Jicker Dixon. Ani Ronda is currently completing her master's at UTS and has lectured there for several years. Um, 
She has over 50 years experience in performing as a writer, actor, collaborator, and consultant. And Ironda, um, building on your welcome, um, I'm, you're going to tell us, tell us more about, you, about your life and experience. And I know it's a tough ask um, for you to tell some of these stories and we're thankful for, for what you can share with us, acknowledging that it's your story to tell and for and, uh, you to tell us what we need to hear. So I'm going to hand over to you and invite you to speak. Thank you, James. And thank you for inviting me to do the welcome and to speak. Uh, so I'm going to speak about um, the history of my people and the political um, journey. Of, uh, I'm going to speak about um, colonisation and genocide and um, the trauma that it has brought on our people and and land, country and the animals. So um, before colonisation, um, Aboriginal people, my people lived in paradise, um, are custodians of the country and um, making sure that the, the land was um, looked after properly and the, and the waterways were fresh and clean and the animals were um, protected. Um, and that's why we were given totems so that um, each person would look after that totem and treat that totem as uh, their brother or their sister. So we had our laws and governance in place and we knew where what our areas were and if we were, wanted to go into another area say for example the Bunjalung or whatever we would have to ask permission and um, also if we wanted to take a, a shell or whatever we'd have to ask permission from the elders of that country so um, that's why we didn't have um, big wars because we had our laws and our governance in place so um, then um, 250 years ago, the, um, the colonizers came and they pushed us back out of, from our traditional areas and put us on missions like La Perouse mission and um, other missions. And that happened all around Australia. But I'll just talk about our people uh, for this, this time now. Um, and, um, and so um, our family, go way back as freedom fighters and um, fighting the wars. Um, the start, we were the first ones to start the fight for the black wars to, to against um, the destruction of our land and um, incarceration, the high incarceration rate, stolen generation. And um, so we were under the white Australia policy and um, Australia wanted to simulate, simulate Aboriginal people and that's why they put, um, took our children away and taught them um, how to clean and cook and all that. And then when the girls was, this happened to my grandmother, and when the girls were 14, they would be sent out as maids and she was sent over to Manly to clean house for the white people over there. Um, so, um, and, and the men were sent out to the, the ranch, the, the farms, to um, do all that work there. And they were treated um, terrible, very cruel, and um, they didn't get paid. Um, sometimes they were supposed to get the sixpence. Like there's a film called Lousy Little Sixpence. And Dad, my father, Chicka Dixon, narrates on that. And, um, yeah, most, most of the time they didn't get paid. And so, and then the, the institutions, my father's um, dad, Jimmy Dixon, and his brothers were placed in the Kinchilla Boys' home. And there was a lot, a lot of cruelty and a lot of graves that were, um, the little children were, were um, buried around from, you know, in, in the areas of those institutions. So um, I just want to talk about um, my grandmother, Maria Locke who was placed in, she was the first Aboriginal child to be placed in the Parramatta Institution. Her um, parents, her grandparent was um, Goomaberry and her dad was Yaramundi. And um, so then Jenny Locke, her daughter, she was in placed in the um, institution at the Domain. And then um, when she was 18, she was living at the boat sheds in Circular Quay. And she used to walk 
across over State Centennial Park. They used to camp there because there's fresh water and the bird, lots of birds and food and that there. And then they'd walk on to La Perouse, um, to our people out there. Um, and I want to just touch on the answer, the Appen massacre that happened to my people where they ran the men, women and children over the cliff, over the gorge, and then the troops went down and they got them and they brought them back up and they hung them up in the trees. And they said to the other Aboriginal people, if you don't do what we ask, that's gonna to happen to you. So our people were living on the Cooks River, camping there at the time to try and, um, you know, not be visible to the troops after the Appen massacre. The other reason they were living there is because they could use the river as a way to escape in their nawis, in their canoes, um, from the troops. Uh, so I just wanted to share those um, things with you. We have reclaimed and renamed uh, Cooks River uh, as Jabagali because that's where all the, all the pelicans are and that's why Cooks River is named Jabagali. And um, so I'll just go on to um, the post-traumatic stress that a lot of Aboriginal people, traditional descendants in this area and all over Australia are, um, are living with because of the trauma of everything taken, the lands are taken, um, our culture was stopped by the White Australia policy, by the Aboriginal Protection Board. Um, we were stopped speaking our languages, dancing our dances, um, doing our art and going out and getting our bush medicines and our ceremonial objects um, that we needed for, you know, the ochres and the woods and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted my, you know, we come from uh, generations of activists and um, just going back to the Cooks River, when um, Pemaway, uh, was fighting the troops and, and our uh, relation, King Kogi, was with Pemaway at the time. And uh, so they knew the areas. So they led the troops because they were on, in, on their horses. So they led the troops into the mud areas um, around the river and the troops got stuck in the mud. And so um, we, our people were able to use that knowledge of the areas to try and fight, you know, uh, for our our people and our country. So from that, there, there's a lot of intergenerational trauma, a lot of um, mental illness, um, you know, drug and alcohol problems, um, high, very high incarceration rates in, in the jails and um, with our youth, 40% um, of the youth incarcerated are Aboriginal. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're um, you know, we're trying to find ways and that, that we can um, bring in programs and build our people up to, um, for wellbeing and um, so that we can get that um, knowledge and self-confidence back to set up businesses and that sort of thing. We're also doing cultural, a lot of cultural resurgence and revival with um, ceremonies and uh, we do a lot um, our people have been doing a lot with Black Lives Matter and um, climate justice rallies over the last couple of years. And we were able to go and do the welcome to country. And um, it's very important that we're able to do that because we're being acknowledged and um, people can see that we're still here. Um, fortunately, um, when a lot of our people were pushed back and put on, um, on um, missions and reservations and that sort of thing. Um, the elders and the knowledge keepers were able to keep um, doing that and collecting the materials, the um, ceremonial materials and the art and that. And so we are able to, um, you know, carry, keep going with our cultural traditions and our collecting our ceremonial objects for ceremony and that sort of thing. So. Um, that, that is a, a wonderful thing. Only um, last weekend, we were out at La Perouse. And um, so there was three generations, myself, my daughter and um, her son. 
and um, we were able to document the mullet, the pulling in of the mullet, which is our cult, one of our cultural traditions. Um, the license was taken away from um, our people to be able to do that for 30 years. So last weekend was very important time for us um, to be able to in, engage in our culture and um, have that wonderful opportunity to be there when, when they pull the mullet in and then be given the, um, the mullet to take home and, and just to talk about our culture and how as children we used to see the elders and our uncles pulling in the mullet and that we were able to um, pass that information down to our, you know, to my grandchildren. And uh, so, you know, very important um, uh, revival of our culture and ceremonies and that. Um, so how we can move forward. Um, I think it's very important that um, Australia acknowledges um, what's happened to our people and being the first First Nations people to um, have that happen to, to us. Um, and the, we know, you know, we, we know a, a lot about our culture and our stories and to, to listen to the, the elders that will tell you about uh, events that's happened and we're able to document that. We've got to document it because our, our people are, are um, you know, getting older and disappearing. And that's why um, we, we use that technology, you know, of film and um, photos and that sort of thing. And I'm doing an education module and a podcast um, with my masters. So it's very important that um, the government and um, other organizations, national parks and different groups that are doing stuff with um, culture, that they engage Aboriginal, the First Nations people to lead those projects. And, and don't just tick the, put them at the tick, I, we call it tick the box. So after they've organized everything and planned everything, then they ask us to come in and show ourselves and then they can tick the box like, oh yes, we consulted with the, with the First Nations people. No, that's not good enough. We have to be approached right from the start and, they, and people have got to listen to us and listen to Aboriginal people all over all over Australia, because we have in-depth knowledge of country and culture and how to keep country well and to keep the waterways well. We're all living in, on Australia. We're all living on Mother Earth. And so you can't eat money, you know. We've got to look after Mother Earth and keep the waterways clean and fresh and respect the animals and the trees, and because it's all connected, and we're all living here together. So we all got to, we've got to sit down and talk. And Australia's got to acknowledge the truth and put it out there in the education systems, like the Maori people have uh, done that with the Pakeha. The Pakeha people know how to speak the Maori language and do the haka. How many Australian people know anything about Aboriginal people or language or anything? No, it's not in the education system. Little bits are, but it's not compulsory. And so until Australia acknowledges what's happened here in Australia and, and sits down and talks with Aboriginal people, um, we are not going to be able to move forward as, as a country because until that's settled and we've had that conversation, to move forward, um, that won't happen until we, we, we're able to sit down and listen respectfully and listen to Aboriginal people. Don't just, oh, yes, yeah, say sorry, and then nothing happens, you know. So um, that's how I, I, you know, I see it, and um, that's what I wanted to, to talk about. Yanu, thank you. Thank you, Aunty Rhonda. Um... You know, living here, where I do, on 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 the edge of, on the edge of Marrickville, on the edge of of Bulanaming, as I understand it, it it once once known. Uh, your stories about about 
what happened just down the road sort of strike particularly close to, to my heart. Um, recognizing we only have you until half past today, uh, we have one question which was essentially asking if you could uh, uh, give an, an example of programs that you found have worked well with, well with young Indigenous people um, in helping them to overcome some of the trauma. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I can honestly tell you that I don't know of any. Um, um, you know, we still need, like, we need to sit down and, and talk about these things and, and um, non-Aboriginal people need to, to listen and take, take on our, what we, you know, what, how we see things, you know. I see things um, that because, like my grandfather said, well, they brought all the sicknesses and the alcohol and everything to us and gave us the trauma, so they need to work with us to help to fix us. So we've got white fella diseases like mental health and drug and alcohol problems that we never had before they came. And so we need these CBT, neuroscience, you know, ways of changing our thought patterns to positive and um, ways and positive parenting and anger management and stuff like that, that the white fellas gave us, put on us and gave us. And we need, we need culture, we need ceremony, we need our art, we need revival of our languages and our stories. Um, so I think this is why we need to sit down and if white fellas generally, genuinely want to um, support Aboriginal people to get, to get well and um, to stand up on our feet, um, I tell the young ones, the teenagers, that you stand up tall and proud and you hold your head up high because you're walking as queens and kings on your country. And, you know, there needs to be ceremony and there needs to be elders, there needs to be knowledge keepers, and we need to get these strong programs together to be able to um, make that change for our future. Thanks, Sunny Rhonda. Um, you've been talking to people as far away, not only as Western Australia and Tasmania, but I've also just seen someone from Bulgaria greeting us in the chat. So uh, you've, uh, your message has, has travelled wide today. Um, yes, I might um, stick around for as long as you can. If there's another question, we'll feed it to you. But meanwhile, um, we're going to move on and I'll invite Professor Henry Reynolds um, Professor Reynolds um, is officially a certified national treasure, apparently. Um, he was so, so honoured in uh, about 1998, I believe. Um, and uh, but that's just one of the countless awards and distinctions he has earned in a, in a career which has been dedicated to understanding and communicating the truth of the violence that accompanied the violent colonisation of Australia. Uh, in 20 books and many articles, um, he's explained the high level of violence and conflict involved in our colonisation and the Aboriginal resistance to numerous massacres of Indigenous people. In his rebuttal of, of criticisms to his research, he's reputed to have said, better a black armband than a white blindfold. Um, and today, he's going to show us the tip of the iceberg of, of, of what he's learned. Um, we only have him and for, for a short time, so uh, ask your questions in the chat. Um, and, uh, and we will get back to you. Uh, Professor Reynolds is going to be followed by Peter, Peter Griffin briefly, who is one of the organisers of Raising Peace also. And he's going to introduce us to an online map of the massacres, which is being prepared by um, Newcastle University. But um, for now, uh, yes, Professor Reynolds, over to you. Right, you can, you can hear me. Yes, you're clear. Right. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to thank Auntie Rhonda for her gracious welcome to her country. Um, I'd also like to begin by stating the obvious that we are 
at the beginning of the Anzac Day weekend. And that reminds us just how important the whole question of war is to contemporary Australia. Uh, the recently uh, replaced Education Minister, Tudge, uh, said indeed that uh, Anzac must never be questioned because it was the most sacred day on the Australian calendar. Now, that uh, reminds us indeed just how much effort Australia put into commemorating the First World War. Australia spent more than any other country, which is extraordinary. And Australia spent $100 million on a, on a museum in northern France about the, uh, you know, the, the fighting of the Australian soldiers in, on the Western Front. Now, that is an extraordinary amount of money, but it's an extraordinary uh, fact when you realise that there is no official recognition of the frontier wars. Now, this is in strong contrast to comparable countries like New Zealand, where we know uh, there is a great deal of recognition. Um, there's never been any suggestion that they weren't important or they weren't fought. Um, but the United States, now, if you look up the list of, you know, the official United States list of the wars, the surprising thing is that every war with an Indian nation, even some of the very small ones that no one's ever heard of, are listed along with America's official wars, including the Civil War and including, you know, the, 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 the two great wars, that the wars with the Indians are recognised as being uh, wars of, of significance. Now, this takes me back to when I began to get a completely different picture of Australian history. I began teaching Australian history in 1966 in Townsville, North Queensland. And at that stage, uh, not only was there almost nothing about Aborigines in the history, in fact, the textbook that I was given to use, which was the most widely used textbook in Australia, that it, it was reprinted 16 times over a 20 year period, there was not anything about the First Nations. There were two uh, references in passing. There wasn't even an entry in the index. Now, I looked up all the reviews of that book. And if you weren't in that book, it was multi-authored, then you probably reviewed it. And not a single one of the reviewers thought there was something wrong that Australian history had simply forgotten, deliberately left out the experience of the First Nations people. And this influenced uh, the idea of the violence. If you left the First Nations people out, you left out much of the violence. And so historians of that period, uh, of the 60s and early 70s, write, wrote about the great peaceful nature of Australian society. Uh, they said things like, Australians have been very slow to kill one another. The great historian of the bush workers, Russell Ward, actually wrote at this time that the, uh, the, the resistance, you know, that the reaction of the Aborigines was so uh, inadequate that men seldom had to go armed on the Australian frontier. <laughs> now, as I discovered soon after that, that was an extraordinary thing to say. But I'll give you one more example. In 1959, at a, at a conference of all the Australian historians, the professor of history at the ANU uh, surveyed Australian history over the previous 30 years. And he said, among other things, one of the most remarkable features of Australian history is we, we pay almost no attention to the Indigenous people unlike New Zealand and Africa and North America. 
And that was because the Aboriginal people were, you know, they, they weren't warriors. They simply, they simply gave in. And so all we do in Australian history is to recognize them as a, as a melancholy anthropological footnote. Now, that was the situation when I began teaching. But of course, living in the North, you see Australia in a very, very different way. And I was instantly aware of just how much violence, contemporary, daily violence there was. And so I began doing research so I could tell my students a different story. And of course, what I found, you only had to start reading the colonial records and newspapers and letters and books to realize that there was a great deal of violence, that the frontier wars continued throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. Now, this, this quite overturned that idea that Australia was peaceful, there was no resistance, uh, these people were no more than an, uh, uh, um, an anthropological footnote. Uh, this increasingly came to be seen as one of the central, most important features of Australian history. It was unavoidable. And so I began uh, writing uh, this, you know, telling people about what was actually there in the records. And I wrote my first article on the subject in 1972, which at the time was seen as, as uh, provocative, uh, troublemaking, but to other people a revelation because I began to tell that story the story of, above all, it was the story of First Nations resistance. That is the central story. And because, as we appreciate now, uh, Australia was, was a, a, you know, a patchwork, a mosaic of small independent nations, the war unfolded in many different ways across the vast continent. And so looking back from now, it's obvious that the war, I think, was the most important war in Australian history, even though it was episodic, because of the nature of First Nations society, it, you know, it, it, you know when, when part of the uh, Australia, the war had, had stopped fighting, it moved as the frontier moved and continued on well into the 20th century, as many people will know. And the death toll is so much higher. I made my first estimate in 1982 when I said it was reasonable to suppose that at least 20,000 Aboriginal people, First Nations people were killed in the conflict. Now, many people, once again, thought that was an exaggeration. They thought it was troublemaking. But that, of course, was far less than the, 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 the true situation. And it is certainly looking as though the death toll in those series of small wars uh, equals the number of people Australians killed in the First World War. And yet, where is the recognition where is, the, where is the understanding about the extraordinary courage, the extraordinary uh, endurance of the people defending their country? And that although in Anzac Day, we do remember the 100,000 or so Australians who died fighting fighting at the uh, request of a democratically government. Uh, they were fighting at the time, as they thought, many in the First World War thought it was for empire and king, but nonetheless, they died fighting for Australia or for a vision of Australia they had. But then whatever on earth do we say to the First Nations people who died in such large numbers often facing impossible odds. Now, the Australian soldiers overseas, of course they suffered. 
Of course they suffered, but they were not fighting over their own land. They were not seeing the destruction of their own country. They were confident that their country was safe and their families were safe. And that if they survived, they could return to their families and to their property and everything would return to normal. And of course, they also had infinitely better health services than many of the people they were fighting against. So I came to the conclusion, having spent a long time looking, doing this research all over Australia, every single part of Australia, that this has to be seen as something of great significance in the history of Australia that the frontier wars were our most important wars because they were fought here in Australia about the ownership and control and sovereignty of Australia. And they continued for 140 or so years. How can we possibly still say these are not significant? And where is the $100 million to set up national museums so this war can be recognized and commemorated and we can pay our due respect to the hundreds of warriors who died fighting for their country i'll finish there because you may well want to have questions and i would be delighted to join in conversation um thank you um Thank you, Professor Reynolds. Um, one question which could go to either you or, or Adi Rhonda uh, at this stage would be, how does a country apologize for this? Like with this was um, paraphrasing something that someone has asked in the chat. It's such, a mo the, the scale of it is so monumental. Like where do you begin? Well, if I can start, look, there are two quite separate, we're talking about two quite separate eras. Now, up till the middle of the 19th century, the people who really should apologise are the British. This was a British imperial exercise. They decided not to recognise Aboriginal property rights or to recognise that the Aboriginal people had any government. They exercised every, any sovereignty. That is, the British began the colonisation of Australia ignoring and, and simply paying no attention to the international law at the time. And the violence was predetermined. That is, the settlers who moved out believed that they had a legal right to the land because the Aborigines didn't own it. So, of course, it was people on the frontier who did the fighting and the killing. But the fundamental problem was the way in which the British imperial government decided to do this. And I think that is who needs to apologize. And I don't think there should be any further visits by members of the British royal family until they come with an apology, as the Maoris asked for and got. But in a, in a way, we, we oh, you couldn't do that. I mean, I suggested this when Tasmania was celebrating its bicentenary and people said, oh, no, you couldn't do that. But that is where you have to go for apology and even for some reparation. It may not necessarily just be money, but the British could do a great deal in providing assistance and providing opportunities for First Nations people to go and study in Britain. Now, that's the first period, but from the middle of the 19th century, the British basically handed the whole question over to the colonial governments. And by 1859, 1860, the whole of Eastern Australia was self-governing. The land had been passed over to the colonial, uh, the colonial governments and control over the First Nations had been given to them. So for the second half of the 19th century, what I call the conquest or the partial conquest of North Australia, you have to turn to the Australian governments, democratically elected governments in Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, in particular Perth after 1890. And so in a way that is 
that is our responsibility. That is the one we have to deal with because uh, this is an Australian responsibility. But you know, so the first part, undoubtedly, we turn to Britain. Mm -hmm. But we have to come to terms with what happened in the second half of the 19th century, mainly across North Australia, where the whole, the responsibility has to be sheeted back to the colonists themselves. Thanks, Henry. Before, before um, Peter shows us the map, did uh, any of the other panelists want to add to, add to that answer? Um, so Ray or Imelda or Louise, if she's here. No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, sorry, go on. No, no, um, no, I agree with um, Professor Reynolds, most definitely. Um, but I don't know what Arnie Ronda's thoughts would be, you know, in terms of an apology and what that would look like. I think she's left though. Yeah, she just, uh, she heard, she heard his main, main talk and then she slipped out. Okay. Um, mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We, we did have an apology from the government back in 2008 by the Rudd government. And for many of our people, um, we received his apology, but we may not have accepted his apology because it didn't come with a lot of uh, um, attributes that show the show how sorry you are um you know um there has to be fruits of repentance or apologies that that are are, are, are um, commensurate to the crime that's been committed we demand that in our courts and uh, an apology of this nature was only delivered to the stolen generations, but what about the genocides and the other frontier wars and all those other things that happened to our people that did not come through as clearly as we would have liked. And that's why we're asking for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the truth telling, a treaty and a voice. I mean, we're so far behind the eight ball in this country is. It's laughable. We're a joke even to ourselves. Yes, the, I mean, Kevin Rudd's apology, you know, was very significant and clearly it was felt that way by many, many people. I was astonished. I was just in Hobart at the, the large number of people who turned out to watch it, but it was indeed directed at the stolen generation. And that, you know, that is an appalling episode and, it was significant that he, he did that and he clearly wrote it himself. Uh, he said it with real feeling. But <laughs> coming from Queensland, I mean, Queensland is above all the place where the violence was unrestrained and where the largest population, I mean, when Queensland gained self government and to run their own affairs. They're only, uh, you know, they only occupy the very small part of the southeast of Queensland. This vast area with very large populations who probably had not been affected by things like the smallpox. And so uh, Queensland had the most violent history. And uh, it is Queensland that has to make amends, as I've argued. Uh, you know, one of the most important figures in Queensland history, the Samuel Walker Griffith, uh, either Premier or Attorney General over a 20 year period. And over that 20 year period, hundreds, hundreds of First Nations people were killed. Now, that mightn't have mattered so much if Griffith hadn't been the great jurist, a great believer in the British common law. And he became the first Chief Justice of the High Court from 1903 to 1919. And he is, you know, he is now lauded. There's a university named after him. There's a Canberra suburb, all of these things uh, that have to be reconsidered. 
as has happened all over America, for instance. There's a great deal of coming to terms with the past that we've scarcely begun to think about in Australia. And this is particularly the case, as I say, with the Australian part of this, uh, that is after the 1850s and Queensland in particular, because we're talking about a very much larger population than in the Northern Territory or, and in, in Western Australia wasn't self-governing until 1890. So it's Queensland that seems to me to be the place where the need for apology is greatest. And I don't think Kevin was the slightest bit interested, I can't say that really, but he didn't show any indication that he thought that was something that had to be included in the sort of apology that is required. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm go going to bring Peter in to introduce us to the map where we can get a, a visual feel of the scale of what's happened. Peter, are you muted? Is that better? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Henry. I've got no doubt that what I'm about to say is a logical consequence of the initiative that you've made in your lifetime to rewrite Australian history. So my name is Peter Griffin. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and the future. And I would like to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. On behalf of Raising Peace and in the spirit of truth telling called for in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, I would like to present an introduction to the University of Newcastle's map of colonial frontier massacres. The map was developed over eight years and was sponsored by the Australian Research Council. The purpose of the project is to provide the first Australia-wide record of frontier massacres based on rigorous methodology. This, by the way, is by no means the full story of the deadly relationship between First Nations and settler people. It's a story that still needs a lot of telling. In this project, a colonial massacre is defined as the deliberate and unlawful killing of six or more undefended people in an operation. The number six was chosen because of its devastating effect that the loss of such a number would have on the typical size tribal or settler group. This map shows 401 attacks on First Nations peoples represented by yellow dots, 12 attacks on colonists represented by blue squares, and in the far northern of the Northern Territory at Malay Bay, one attack on non-colonists. They were Macassans from Indonesia who used ceremonial string to, to make their nets. The word frontier is an important reminder that the conflicting relationship between First Nations people and colonists was about many things, but ultimately about the land itself. Wherever the frontier of the colony extended for the first time, clashes followed, resulting in many deaths. The truth is, the colonists could only thrive by displacing the First Nations people. Thus, the research project concluded that the aim of frontier massacre was either to eradicate the victims completely or force the survivors into submission. The purpose was to clear the First Nations people from a given area. Stage four of the project revealed clusters of massacres, which were so deliberately planned and carried out over weeks or over days or weeks that 19 such cluster, uh, clusters were classified as genocidal massacres, intended to kill every Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person in a region. So how to access the map? The first way is to use the link that you see there, which you'll find in the chat box. Second way is you can use the QR code, which is also in the chat box. 
or you can simply Google Colonial Frontier Massacres, which will bring up websites that you can choose and click on the map. This is the map page that you'll see when you first log in. Notice at the bottom of the page, the blue timeline running west to east, 1788 to 1930. By clicking on the circle at 1930 and holding, you can move back in time to see the most recent attacks disappear. Alternatively, the circle back, if you take the circle back to 1800 and press the start button on the left, you can watch the time frame move along to reveal attacks as they occurred. Secondly, on this map, you can refer to the white information box on the right and click on the highlighted introduction. Notice the 12 information headings and plus the menu bar at the top. In terms of use are found in the about heading of the menu bar. It's important to note that the website, including text, data, map and software is protected by copyright. By enlarging the map to isolate either a dot or a square and click on it, a small white information box appears with some basic information about the event. But by clicking on the word details, a larger page will appear showing a 3D map of the area and narrative details. The amount of information varies, incident to incident. However, I've found the details to be very harrowing. Many of the stories found here show a callous dehumanizing attitude towards First Nation people. It's not only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have lost something forever. The inescapable truth is that Australia is born of blood and lost humanity on both sides. Perhaps the only way that something can be rescued for both is to allow the truth to be known widely and deeply. At this point in our history, Australia has the opportunity to lift the veil, to acknowledge the truth of our origins as a nation. It's not easy to be confronted by the truth. It takes courage and a great deal more. The alternative is to suffer what Father Ted Kennedy, the priest of Redfern, identified 20 years ago. Unacknowledged truth has a way of setting bands on the soul. The paralysis chokes. And unacknowledged truth has one of those perverse ways of imposing a sadness and guilt on the victim's heart. As we move forward, may the revelations contained in the project of the Colonial Frontier Massacres, which are but the tip of the iceberg, help us all to embrace truth-telling about our shared history. The citation page acknowledges the nature and history of the project, as well as listing the research team. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's uh, truly sobering to, uh, to see what we've been talking about laid out visually like that and, uh, and having uh, having experimented with the map myself you know, moving the slider and, and seeing seeing the frontiers advance across the country is is a, a, a devastating experience really um but we're going to move on um we're a little bit behind time but we also appear to be missing a speaker at this stage so we're still we'll, we'll see how we how we go at the end our next speaker is Councillor Imelda Davis. Um, Imelda is a long-standing advocate for the descendants of Blackbird and South Sea Islanders. I was cheering Imelda on as she ran successfully for a seat on Sydney City Council last year, and she's already has, having an impact there, as I'm sure she'll tell us shortly. Imelda is proud of her diverse Indigenous ancestry as a second-generation Australian South Sea Islander of First Nations and Caribbean descent. Imelda has worked for federal, state, community and grassroots organisations where she has exhibited diverse expertise in, um, in community development, education, training, media and marketing 
and perhaps most prominently as chairwoman of the Australian South Sea Islanders of Port Jackson since 2009. Um, Imelda has told me, and I think of Raising Peace previously, that, uh, that the South Sea Islander experience in Australia is challenging. As not only have they been victims of violence, they've also been used to inflict violence on others as well. Um, so Imelda is, is going to tell us something of that. And uh, uh, yes, how those pieces of, of history sort of fit into the life of her community today. Um, Melda, um, let's hear your story. Thank you. And I'd like to um, acknowledge that I'm on Gadigal country uh, here in Piemont. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share more of uh, a lot of the advocacy um, around recognition and greater inclusion for Australian South Sea Islanders. And uh, James, I just emailed you a map. I don't know if it's too late to put that up on screen while I speak, but um, I'm just gonna go over a bit of, um, you know, the fact that we are descendants of some 60 odd thousand uh, Melanesian laborers that were brought to Australia this year marks uh, from the islands of Vanuatu and Solomons and those other affected islands were uh, Kiribati, Tuvalu, New Caledonia, Papua, New Guinea, um, obviously Vanuatu, Solomons. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, an ongoing battle that this year is 175 years since Benjamin Boyd brought the first 200 uh, people, uh, men, to work on his uh, whaling industries in Eden, New South Wales. And um, still today, we are struggling for uh, greater inclusion and understanding of this trade. It's unknown to many of us um, across uh, the nation. And uh, the map on the screen just shows the some 800 routes that brought these men in from their island states. And some of those island states lost entire male populations over a 40 odd year period. Uh, so 1847, Port Jackson with Benjamin Boyd, but also uh, 1860s um, coming through the Torres Strait, some 3000 London missionaries, South Sea Islanders, um, you know, colonialism in terms of um, bringing Christianity to the islands. Uh, and today that's uh, recognized on the cultural calendar as July 1 or July 1. But um, my grandfather was uh, 12 years old. That's mum's dad taken from Tana Island. And my great grandmother, Sarah Bukitoa was taken from Umbai. And she was 14 years old and brought to work on a plantation in Maryborough. Um, as a, as a, I guess a house house girl, if I if that's the right term for it, um, but then also her, uh, my nana was born on that plantation in Maryborough to a Terry Santo, and he was from a mission in Harvey Bay. Um, I've traced my ancestry uh, through the names, and that's the Santo name also going back to uh, Cape York. Bamiga and Arab Islands. Uh, apparently that name is quite a strong and significant in speaking to Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and uh, that Santo name is also very prominent in the Townsville region as well. And, uh, you know, very fortunate to be elected to sit on uh, Team Clover for uh, the elections last year, and it's been a hard slog, but more recently, um, I uh, put forward a, a notice of motion because of this 175 years, and um, that recognises, that the City of Sydney will recognise Australian South Sea Islanders and look at supporting us in th through, uh, I guess, development greater programs and services and making sure that we uh, look at flying that flag on our cultural calendar of the 25th of August annually um, from here on in. Uh, the city is a great platform for social justice and um, they are committed wholeheartedly to supporting greater understanding, 
deep community consultation and including Australian South Sea Islanders as a part of the 2030-2050 uh, strategic plan for our city. And where uh, there may be challenges uh, in sort of getting certain recognitions alongside education, training and greater understanding for, I guess, programs and services, they will assist with doing, I guess, uh, lobbying government, New South Wales and Commonwealths uh, to develop these programs and services. It's very much about um, a community, you know, our identity is really evolving in terms of people tracing our history, our languages, our heritage, and uh, our communities are evolving in that uh, the next generation are really drilling down on unpacking their uh, bloodlines and uh, diverse ancestry. Many Australian South Sea Islanders are of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander descent because the manner of the trade, uh, you know, brought an influx of, uh, you know, 95% men over that period. 5% were women and the children are unknown, but there's oral histories that uh, depict, um, you know, just what happened with those uh, women and children and who they were. And there's much more research that needs to be done on so much more uh, in terms of those, those shipping routes. And um, we're collaborating with the uh, University of New South Wales, Dr. Emma Christopher, on a project that will assist us in potentially, um, well, it is uh, assisting us in tracing some of those shipping routes, as well as uh, looking at databases that may develop uh, like a finding family opportunity uh, for us in connecting the dots, similar to link up, but I guess, you know, um, it's still being fleshed out. Uh, but the essence of it is about reconnecting with the islands, reconnecting with our families and needing to reconnect in Australia with our families, you know, because we are, you know, largely displaced, absorbed under um, Aboriginal Protection Acts um, of the 1930s. We are not uh, we don't come under the banner of, of multiculturalism because we are a distinct cultural group that requires its recognition uh, first and foremost and building capacity so that we can be considered as a part of that multicultural framework potentially, but that's up to the community as well. It's not just me saying that. And uh, we are pre-Federation, uh, so we don't come under post-war um, uh, multiculturalism, which was formed in the 1930s. So, yeah, it's it's you know it's a work in progress, I guess, and and it's not um, it's on the you know the shoulders of greats such as um, Pastor Ray Minicon is on this call, and you know all that advocacy uh, that Arnie Ronda was a part of back in the 70s. Uh, Australian South Sea Islanders have stood strong and in solidarity and First Nations first with all that we do. Um, in advocating for this recognition, uh, but simultaneously, this is a narrative that really does need to be understood and, and uh, alongside our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families because of the complexity of it. And our own communities are very challenged with understanding this history through um, identity, but the more, in, and how to identify also. Um, my lived experience is Australian South Sea Islander, raised on the Tweed, born in Brisbane, raised on the Tweed in a strong South Sea Islander, um, you know, activist family with the likes of, you know, Aunty Faith Bandler, the Corowas, um, a number of other, my family, Inez. Um, and then you've got uh, the Fingal mob, uh, staunch uh, Aboriginal community on the other side of the river. So that lived experience as well. But how do we how do we um, create a better understanding for our our communities? And it's it is causing a lot of divide in how people are sort of coming up and identifying as well. So we've got this whole uh, challenge um, with identity politics, I guess, if I can say that. And uh, yeah, but it's you know it's 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 hard. And uh, when I think about the frontier wars and the and the map that we've just witnessed um, in terms of the atrocities that have occurred and the South Sea Islanders being brought in to actually have their hand forced as a part of some of that, you know, truth telling, there's a lot of healing that needs to be 
done in in recognition and inclusion across these these uh, very important uh, platforms of history uh, that are untold still today. So uh, we're in consultation at the moment with Benjamin Boyd uh, Department National Parks and Wildlife about the Benjamin Boyd change of name that's going through um, that was passed by uh, put forward by um, Minister Keane and and it's it's a difficult conversation uh, because there's so many different clans involved. Um, but the fact is, is that there were some 200 of our Melanesian men brought to those uh, that station by by Boyd. So how do we, I guess, how do, how how do we remember? Uh, yes, change the name First Nations, but how are we included in in that memory of of what occurred and some of the um, challenges around? Uh, identity politics that that exists in those regions as well but um yeah i might leave it there i don't know if there's anything else you want to ask maybe <laughs> yeah i'm sure some questions will come up i mean i yeah. i um like there's also ben boyd road in nipra bay which i'm sure, oh, sure you're aware happening. of yeah i mean i i, I uh, won't do it was involved in a, in a conversation on, on Facebook one day and like the pile on uh, the suggestion of changing yeah. the name was quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but uh, people were pushing back on that. Look, look, and, and that's the thing. It is, and this is what I said to um, the gentleman that was, I had a meeting with yesterday who's been, you know, commissioned to do this work for the Benjamin Boyd change of name. And, and I said to him, even with our advocacy over the years about Benjamin Boyd and the truth needing um, to be told is that my own personal opinion is that it's not necessarily, yes, it's an atrocity and the names need to be changed, but how do you still include that narrative around that, that person, you know? Um, and, and, you know, because it's, it's like we're, we're fighting to be remembered as a forgotten people. So, for, for me personally, I feel, how can I impose that on someone else, someone else's history, as bad as it is? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, you know, I think truth telling is really important and it's how we resolve issues around that truth. Um, yeah. But anyway, because everyone's got a mother, everyone's got a father, everyone's got a sense of belonging for whatever reasons. And yeah, sure, we've suffered severely. Um, but yeah, I'm just, it's challenging. Um, so I've put in the chat uh, the website, which shows the notice of motion. Um, and you can go in there and look at, um, and if anyone's got suggestions in how, how we can work better with the city of Sydney and bringing to light uh, this, this rich history um, that recognises Sydney as, as playing a key role as a part of the blackbirding era, in, in particular Burnsville, the Sugar Wharf here uh, where I live, CSR Sugar on Pirama Park, um, Benjamin Boyd, of course, and also Robert Towns, Townsville. He was a, um, you know, celebrated, they're all celebrated entrepreneurs and sitting on the chambers, Chamber of Commerce for Sydney and he managed how many ships that he owned that brought people into these regions. Um, I think Professor Reynolds was talking about Townsville. Was he from Townsville or he, he worked in Townsville? But there was some 8,000 uh, PNG mob, you know, bought um, into Townsville, mm. you know, and the manner in which they were treated and slaughtered and, and just, you know, there's, there's so much in terms of those wars and, and atrocities that occurred that it's so layered for us, you know? Um, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, just um, uh, Chris in the chat was asking for a bit more information about the 25th of August. Why is that date important? Um, the 25th of August marks um, the 1994 Commonwealth recognition of Australian South Sea Islanders. And it's the work done from... Um, the likes of um, Aunty uh, Faith Bambler and our families from the Tweed. Um, I come from a very staunch activist family and they, Aunty Phyllis Korowa, Uncle Robert Korowa, Marg Togo, um, Uncle Alan Togo, and they advocated and, and in 1992, they re, um, 
they were supported by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission to go out and assess uh, the community demographic and the needs of the community, which were identified as suffering the same disadvantages as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, um, as well as um, you know, the, the need for recognition and a sense of belonging in that we are Australian South Sea Islanders. And that depicts the era of 1847 to 1908, I say, uh, for those that blackbirding era. Um, and that's why a lot of people say, oh, South Sea, South Sea, I'm this, but I get that. But in terms of what those elders call for uh, and, and what was recognised by Commonwealth is something that we need to um, need to remember, but also that it relates, Australian South Sea Islanders relates to our belonging in this country um, because of descendants of that blackbirding era. So yeah, so the 25th of August, 1994 was recognition day. And it's on the um, Australian cultural calendar as such. But we need to maybe think about how we can participate in that day and, and maybe everybody get a flag and raise a flag or host a series or you know something on that day that, that remembers uh, those that actually built the economy uh, alongside our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. Um, and, and suffered sig significantly um, to do that. Okay, thank you, Amelda. I think sharing that that map uh, would be a pretty potent thing as well. Like yeah. it, it tells a story so powerfully. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this stage, we're going to move on to Pastor Ray Minicon. Um, and uh, yes. We're still missing our final speaker, Louise. So, Louise, if you're there hiding under another name in the participants, um, let us know in the chat so we can get to you. But otherwise, Ray will be our final speaker, and there's still plenty of chance for questions too. Um, so, um, as Imelda hinted, uh, Pastor Ray is, is is in part South Sea Islander himself, um, coming, um, and that side of his ancestry is from Ambrim Island in Vanuatu. Um, but he is also um, uh, First Nations Aboriginal uh, roots in the Kabi Kabi and Gurungurung tribes of Qu from Queensland. Um, he's dedicated his life to supporting members of the Stolen Generations and has spoken about Indigenous issues at local, national and international forums. Indeed, in 1995, he was spoke at the UN in, in Geneva on behalf of Indigenous peoples at the first hearing of the draft Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, Ray's also the founder of the Coloured Diggers March in Redfern, and that's and it's this that has brought him to this panel today. And he'll inter introduce to the story of those Indigenous people who fought under the Australian flag. So uh, over to you, over to you, Ray. Mm. <clears throat> thanks, James, and thanks for a tough gig here, mate. You know I've got to follow these incredible speakers. I feel so. In, inadequate and ill-equipped to do something of this nature. Uh, I just wanted to say also to Peter on his uh, uh, thank you for that for your uh, expose on on the massacres. There was a lady in the 1980s, and I just forget her first name, but it's Mitigo, and she she wrote the first book on the massacres in this country, and she came from Canberra. And I don't know if it's still published or not, but I had, do have a copy of that. And the second thing I wanted to say about that is that uh, those massacres were even past the 1930s because I have sat at the feet of one of those victims of the massacres up there in Cairns when there was a massacre up there in the Red Lynch area and those uh, survivors were still in that area there and they still had memories of that. One of the old ladies, very dear friend of my mother's as well, was telling us that particular story of the massacre that happened up there. So it's not an ancient story for us. And I have sat at the feet of other uh, survivors of the Coniston massacre, for example, out there in uh, Tennant Creek and Alice Springs, who told us of all the things that they had to do to avoid getting slaughtered at that particular time in their history and they're still around today so still in their memory in terms of the uh, color digger march 
you know, in terms of this story anyways, when we're talking about peace in our country, one of the problems I think that we face as Aboriginal people is this question of who the heck is the aggressor here? Because the moment we get up to speak out, we're put on the, in, on the side of the aggressor, not the victim. But we are the victims, speaking up about our pain of what we've suffered. And it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, seems to be a psychosocial uh, challenge for us to actually uh, talk about these kind of challenges that we face as the victims, not as the aggressor. Um, and somewhere down the track, we're going to have to resolve that particular issue for uh, the rest of Australia. The Colour Digger project <clears throat> came out of all of these stories that we've heard, Pema Way, a whole lot. And it came out of my own grandfather's story. He fought in World War I. He was in the 11th Light Horse. But who the heck knew about that? <laughs> and the 11th Light Horse had one of the highest numbers of average, or the Light Horse, I should say, had the, one of the highest numbers of Aboriginal people in one particular brigade. And... When you're talking about Gallipoli, you know, as Aboriginal people anyways, we think we scratch our heads in despair because here is a nation that's celebrating a defeat. And they just escape with their head, <clears throat> you know, from that defeat. And uh, then they ran into, into the Palestinian conflict. And in the Palestinian conflict, they had one particular victory there at Beersheba, when the Ottoman Empire actually surrendered to the uh, to the Light Horse before uh, the British took possession of that story. Um, so, we, we, with the it came out of my my grandfather's story, <clears throat> and I wanted to honour him so that he's not forgotten, not just only by our own families, but by the rest of Australia. So when we first went out to uh, kickstart our march in 2007, we came ag across this aggressor victim mentality again, because the moment we invited people to come and march with us, two of the strongest, uh, you know, the most powerful people who sort of like control the whole uh, military conflict in the country are the was the president of the RSL at the time and the Minister for Defence and what was his name? His name was Brendan Nelson. When we invited them to come and show their respect as well as their stories about uh, the exploits of our Aboriginal soldiers, the first thing that they said was in the press that they would not recognise our march. And by saying that they would not recognise our march, they were saying very clearly that they would not recognise the services of our people. And that's 2007. And we had to march because of that. We had to march in the streets there. And so out of that came what we call the Coloured Digger March. But the Coloured Digger is a poem. And I encourage you to go and read that poem. It was written by a bloke by the name of a Canadian bloke, not an Australian. It was written by a Canadian. His name was Bert Beros. And he saw the exploits of the Aboriginal soldiers in the Papua New Guinea conflict. And the colour digger, his name is Harold West. He's a real person. His ancestors still live out there in Gaduga and Wheeler Maringal. And uh, um, we started to use that poem as a way of trying to get the support and the emotions of uh, what happened to our people through that particular poem. Now, we know it's changed since that time. And we're only talking about the 1940s, the late 1940s. So uh, that's what the poem is based on. The story, well, there's a couple of stories that came out of that, a couple of uh, Aboriginal people who came out from that particular uh, story who fought in Papua New Guinea. Uh, sadly, uh, Uncle Harold, he passed away up there in, uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, but 
there was a person there who knew him very well and who wrote about his exploits. And if you read his exploits, you will find that uh, he deserves a medal for what he had done there in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, his, his platoon and his company in that particular conflict, a very tough conflict. <clears throat> so we decided to march. And it was a big march in the first one there because of the incredible uh, media that attention that uh, the chairperson or the president of the RSL and the Minister for Defence at the time, Brendan Nelson, gave us because of their refusal to march and or to refusal, refusal to recognise our march. But when we did march, a number of incredible things took place out of that. <clears throat> One was suddenly we had a nation that was interested in these particular Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander diggers and the ways in which they have also fought <clears throat> in all of these different wars throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole of Australia in, in, and throughout the whole world. For example, Auntie Rhonda's, one of Auntie Rhonda's ancestors was there in the Sudan War. Now, we probably don't even know that Australia fought in the Sudan War because we weren't a Commonwealth then, but an Aboriginal soldier was there. We also know that Aboriginal people fought in the Boer War before we became a, a Commonwealth. And I had the honour uh, a year ago to lay to rest, finally, a war hero from that, an Aboriginal war hero. His name was Jack Alec Bond. He was buried out here in the Botany Cemetery in an unmarked grave. And so we had done the research and uh, we, we went out there and made sure that he had got his final request to be buried under military honours. My grandfather, for example, is buried up in Gympie. He's in an unmarked grave. And I need to go back home sometime and I'm working on that to go and make sure that he gets the proper recognition that he deserves for the services that he has committed. And uh, sadly, I just buried my brother uh, up in Darwin and uh, he had done four tours of Vietnam in different battalions. He was one of the first over there. And so he's got a lot of citations and uh, and stuff of that nature. And um, I was very honoured to be uh, his brother. Uh, he's one of my heroes. And I also had another brother in Vietnam as well. I myself couldn't go because of the three person rule, but I did um, join the uh, citizens military forces, which now has merged into the reserve forces um many many years ago so the color digger came out of all of these kind of experiences and all this particular knowledge that was that's in the hearts and hearts and minds of a lot of people and so this year i invite you to come down to redfern at two o'clock and march with us and later on at three o'clock to lay some wreaths at redfern park bring your own wreath and we will uh, be honouring our our uh, our indigenous diggers again, because you know today we take for granted our peace and prosperity. We can't even begin to imagine what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander warriors saw and experienced in the battles that they that they fought during World War One and World War Two. But their bravery and courage, along with all the other diggers during World War One and Two, needs to be honoured, recognised, and remembered by all Australians. And so when you look into the lives of uh, some of these uh, stories, they are quite astonishing. It's, and this year we're honouring not just only our Aboriginal warriors, our heroes, but we're also uh, including our heroines because we did, ha we did have a lot of Aboriginal people who also, uh, women who, who also were a part of the war effort in this country, but without recognition. And remember, many of them were also um, still under the act at that time. 
one of the most tragic aspect of their service is not in them going over the top and running at machine guns and dying, but it came after they returned to their country. When they came back home to Australia, they were shunned, their sacrifices ignored, their families suppressed even further by the respective state and federal governments with such cruel in initiatives as the soldier settlement scheme, which they didn't get. The return so they, these returned soldiers were not even allowed to have a drink with their comrades at the local pub. They were told to march at the back of the line. There was no government support for the wounded or, or mentally scarred veterans. And then while they were over the sea, overseas uh, uh, fighting for this country here, back home here in this country, their children were being forcibly removed and became part of the stolen generation. And I have stories, I carry these stories in my heart of those fathers who came back trying to get their children away from the Aboriginal Protection Act and take them home, but they weren't allowed to. And so these are the warriors that I need to honour, that we all need to honour every year. And so our our plan is to make sure that not only do we honour them, but we also respect and recognise their services. People have asked me, you know, Ray, how long are you going to march in the streets to get this recognition? I said, well, you just got to go over to this little country called New Zealand and look at the ways in which that country has embraced the Maori warrior. It would be unthinkable for that little nation to whitewash the Maori warrior out of their national narrative, their national story. It's impossible. It's also impossible for that little country to whitewash the frontier wars out of their national story. It's just impossible. But you can come back to this country and you can see the whitewashing still here. We don't know how to remove it. Or should I say we're trying to remove the flame and whitewash because we have to have a truth and reconciliation commission. We just got to have it. We've got to have some kind of a treaty or some kind of an agreement of why you are in my country. We're still at war. The war has not ceased. And so in our peace making, in our peace talks, we need to recognize in this country that the war for us has not started. We're not even at the place where we can start the conversations around a treaty or even around the truth of the history, or even importantly too, having a voice that we elect, a voice that represents our people, not one that's legislated by flame and uh, uh, by, by, by government. That's our desire and that's what we want to do. And so we'll continue to march in the streets of Redfern year after year until we are satisfied that we get the appropriate recognition, the appropriate honour and the appropriate respect, not just for our soldiers who fought overseas, but also for our frontier warriors. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Um, you say they were a hard act to follow. You should try talking after you. <laughs> um, yeah, we were supposed to have another speaker at this point, but it appears that she isn't here. Um, but you have also very eloquently in your closing comment um, encapsulated, I think, the importance of what she was going to talk about, which was the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And it's three the three components that uh, that we uh, that we all, all know of being you know, the constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament, um, the uh, telling the, the the telling of truths and formula and formulating a treaty, um, and uh, I, I think you've articulated beautifully how important that is and i'm sure most of the people on here are very much aware of the efforts that, that are going forward at the moment in, in that area um, and we can only hope that comes to pass um, 
There haven't been many questions from people. There have been a, a few observations about things. Um, I think that I did have one question which um, is worthwhile sort of putting generally to people, which is uh, what are the lessons that we can draw from world history about how long it can take to understand the truth and to reconcile? Perhaps the answer, perhaps the answer is, is in the question. It just takes a long time. There was quite a lot of observation about the length of things that were happening. Um, so, uh, yes, I might. So we're, we're on half past three, which is more or less what we wanted to do. James. Um, yes, go on. Just for people's interest, I have just uh, placed in the chat room there our order of service for the day. It's in a PDF. Mm. Uh, um, it, it, the one that I've got is the one that we've got all done up like nice, but if everybody wants to see the time times and all that kind of stuff and read some of the background, it's there for them to uh, to download. Mm. Thank you. Um, so what we might do at this stage is I might invite each of our um, uh, Imelda and Ray, if there is sort of something final that you wanted to uh, observe, and then we'll finish up. And as, as I said before, um, we have the opportunity to, um, after we're going to hear a bit of music, just for anyone who wants to, to stick around and we can just have, have a bit of a yarn about what we've heard and a chance to have a, a virtual tea and biscuit. Um, seeing as we can't do it face to face. So yeah, Imelda and Ray, did you have any final observations? Um, I, I, I have a request in that um, people could please take a look at the notice of motion, uh, which was sent to you um, and, and reflect on, I guess, how, how can the city of Sydney work better because of all of us, yeah? So how do we work better to sort of raise the awareness around um, this history? It's, it's, you know, it's something that I guess it's going to take all of us rather than just some of us. Hmm. Yeah, look, uh, for me, um, we're not even in kindergarten yet when it comes to these kind of challenges. Hmm. And perhaps we don't even want to go into kindergarten to learn about them, about how we live together and how to live together peacefully. I mean, one of the, one of the most and most important um, things for us to do is, as humans on this planet is, is, is to practice reconciliation. I mean, real reconciliation, not the silly reconciliation we're going through. And if we can't do that then you know when i say reconciliation i'm saying reconciliation not only amongst us as humans but also with our earth mother our planet if we could if we could get our heads around what it means to be reconciled to each other we might have a better world that we can live in but i can't see us coming to grips with these kind of challenges and these kind of issues uh, in my generation anyways, it seems to have escalated uh, in my generation rather than decreased. And so people, we've got a huge, big amount of work to be done. Do we have to keep on marching in the streets? Do we have to keep on writing letters? Do we have to keep on writing new policies and procedures? Why can't we just do something in our local communities and our local families to make sure that we're growing the kinds of reconciliatory leaders that we require for our future generations. Because I think our, our, this generation of young kids are saying, you failed us, you're continually failing us. Where is the vision for our country and where are we heading? Uh, so that's my final piece of word there. Let's get real. Let's get out there and try to do something and make it happen fast. 
not just for ourselves, but for our climate, for our country, for our youth, for our families. Thank you, Bill. We'll finish on that inspirational note. Um, now, we've got a bit of music to lead us into the, uh, the, our informal chat afterwards. Um, so Mansi's going to play a video for us. Um, so thank you, Mansi, who's been our tech support through all of this. Um, thank you to all of the speakers today. That includes uh, Professor Reynolds and Ani Ronda, who aren't there anymore, Peter, who showed us through the map, and of course, Ray and Imelda. Um, and so the video is coming on now. It's the Makarata song, Straight From The Heart by Triple Effect. Thank you. They gathered in the heart of the white brown land, put their differences aside, said together we stand. You ask what we want, so we'll tell you straight that our people are hurting. But it's not too late If you really want to help heal Wound of the past And really close the gap With some justice at last We'll tell you straight, straight from, from the heart, the heart straight, straight from the heart of this land So they spoke and they sang Till they worked it all out Three tasks to do One word to shout there's a voice to be heard, truth to be told, treaty to be signed, the right wrongs of old. Magarada we want, Magarada's a cry. From the great red rock under the southern sky, we speak straight from the heart, we cry straight from the heart of this land. To Canberra they came, said, here's what we say. If you want to walk with us, this is the way. The camera said, no, you asked for too much. We wanted something with a much lighter touch, something we can sell. Those on the right who can't see past their blindfolds. Into the light, what's straight from the heart? Straight from the heart of this land. Wait. Okay. But Makarata's already 200 years late. No time like now to do what we must. And bury Terra Nullius under the dust of this bloodstained country, this heartbroken land. Where the red rock itself cries in the sand Straight from the heart Straight from the heart of this land Now the heart of this land isn't just a room It's what beats in the chest of me and of you It's what cries in the soul of this country we share It's what sings in the side the dreams that we dare, it's what lifts us to hope and care for each other, drives the blood in the bond of sister and brother, it's what gives us our strength to rise above fears, it's the rock of our dreams, our hopes and our tears, it comes straight from the heart, straight from the heart of this land. So if we want it to be, it's over to us. We can't leave it to others. We learn not to trust. Makarata we need. Makarata the way to a much better future. To a brand new day where the clear light of truth will finally be shone on all of the lies about what has been done. Where those who've been silenced be given their voice And those who won't listen won't have any choice But to sign the damn treaty Pay the damn rent for country and lives Stole 
rolling and spent. We'll sing it and shout it throughout this land until justice prevails and as one we all stand. Singing straight from the heart, crying straight from the heart of this land. We'll sing it and shout it throughout this land until justice prevails and as one we'll stand. Singing straight from the heart, crying straight from the heart. Singing straight from the heart, crying straight from the heart of this land. Okay, thank you. Wow, so many people have stuck around. It's very exciting. So uh, I guess people have some things to say. And I see that Ray, that Ray is still with us also. Um, so yeah, a huge amount to digest from that. So I guess if anyone wants to sort of share some thoughts about what they've heard, we can start having a conversation. And uh, yeah. Hello, this is Kay on the telephone. Oh, hello, Kay. I remember you from last time. Nice to hear your voice. Hello. Um, yeah, now, I had uh, a question, but the people that it's addressed to have gone, the historians. Mm. Penny Reynolds was talking about $100 million is really due uh, to establishing a museum uh, to recognize the truth of the um, frontier wars. And um, I went to the Mile Creek Memorial last year and they're trying to raise uh, money for such a museum up there, actually, that could be, they envision just it could be a national museum. Um, but I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just wondering how many people would go there because it's a bit of a pilgrimage to go all the way out there. I mean, it's a wonderfully moving event as it is at the moment. Um, but should a museum be in one of the, in the capital city in Canberra? I'm just wondering. Ray, do you want to have a crack at that? What do you think? Uh, I wouldn't be satisfied with one because each state had their own ways of eliminating us and committing genocide on us. And so each state needs to, uh, in their own sovereign way anyways, uh, show the, the truth of our stories. Um, like uh, uh, the professor said, uh, you know, I'm a Queenslander. I know what that the brutality of those those policies were, and uh, I'd like to see something in Queensland, New South Wales, right throughout the whole country, rather than just one place. Because a lot of people ain't going to come down to Sydney or to go down to Canberra to see see all this. And we shouldn't just put, there should be one in the national capital by by all means. But goodness gracious me, uh, if we're fair dinkum about it, then I I'd, I'd rather see one in. In every um, in every state, um, and even down a bit further than that, in every city and town where, especially where these massacres occurred, just like the the Mile uh, Mile Creek massacre with the, that particular story there, and as you saw on the map, you know each of those towns needs to take responsibility for those uh, massacres and perhaps show the. Uh, <clears throat> their way of uh, being not just apologetic but reconciliatory in the processes of building peace within their own communities. And perhaps if we can do something of this nature, we might not have so many of our children taken as uh, prisoners of war by the government, as well as our children put into jails as prisoners of war. So yeah, it'd be great to have, but I doubt if it doubt if this generation has that kind of appetite for that kind of uh, justice. Should they sit alongside the uh, boards and pillars of the war memorials that are in every town? 
Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Yeah, we've got a long way to go, and even just giving that recognition <laughs> on Anzac Day, so we've got a long way to go. We do. Please, people, jump in. Uh, James, uh, Doug Hewitt here. I uh, certainly support Ray in his suggestion that it's up to local areas to try and come together and try and establish uh, memorials. I've been a frequent visitor to Mile Creek and uh, it's been a great initiative there, but it began locally and therefore it's up to uh, we European people to get into dialogue with the locals. I live in the Hunter region now, and I think we should have a conversation about the massacres that occurred throughout the Hunter region. And I'm hoping that we can take that up with the local uh, Awabakal and Waramai people and establish uh, some kind of memorial. I'm sure that local councils can give support to this too and allocate space in parks. Um, we're getting a peace memorial established in a park in Newcastle. And I think that's the beginning of uh, uh, something being done at the local level. So um, all strengths to raise concept of doing it locally. Mm. Yeah, and thank, thank you. And Ray has to go now, um, he just messaged. So thank you very much, Ray, and, and for being our last, our last panelist standing. Uh, James, Don Reid here in, uh, in Bunbury, Western Australia. Um, thinking of doing things locally, I've been making a couple of notes in the chat uh, about the local Anglican Synod is, is attempting to do something just with the Noongar Nation. And um, it, it's a bit more than a city locality, of course. It's, uh, I think the Noongar Nation is actually an area the biggest in Australia. Um, can't be sure of that, but I think I remember that. Uh, but in terms of uh, language um, rescue, it's probably uh, the poorest. Uh, mm. Well, uh, but yes, offering an apology uh, is on the agenda at least. Uh, it's been passed as a synod uh, um, uh, thing, and um, I, I'm on this. Uh, committee of four uh, who are attempting to put some of it into into action mm. Quite a lot of work, work to be done mm. uh, the truth telling has occupied our thoughts uh, and uh, we're, we're going down the path of doing a, a, a sort of an exhibition looking at uh, asking Noongar painters to express the stories in in art and uh, we're also doing some oral history recordings of uh, local um, stories. Um, uh, the problem <laughs> that I'm facing with that particular one at the moment is what do you do with them then when you've got them? Because uh, there's copyright issues. You don't want uh, uh, people making money out of the stories and uh, not giving it back to the storyteller. All that sort of stuff anyway. I won't go into those details, but at least the effort is being made locally. Uh, yeah, that's really great to hear. And especially, it's also very nice to have you coming into this from Western Australia. Um, okay. It's nice to know that the word has spread that far. Yep. Um, and uh, after such a you know intense hour and a half, like um, knowing that there are, these stories of practical action that are taking taking place all across the country is um, very encouraging. Very small, but yes, mm. encouraging. Yeah. Um, I've got a comment about oral histories and the copyright. And yeah. um, my local library is taking oral histories of um, elder residents, uh, any elder residents, not particularly. No, uh, just um, so, so, just as part, so they're running this oral history project, and uh, people who take part and give their oral histories 
have to sign off the copyright yes. um, to to the uh, library. So, yes, I, I, um, I've, I've been in touch with yeah. our state library, and and they that they've yeah. told me the same thing. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, so they, they, there are well established protocols and procedures. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very complicated stuff to get into. <laughs> Went for a. For <laughs> a I feel quite mm. green about all of this. <laughs> Hello, Anne. Hi. I can. I say something. I work yep. in um, Alice Springs uh, Prison. I was very struck by what Ray said about uh, particularly the use, you know, the prisoners of war. And, you know, there should be damages. There should be the same as Legacy actually looked after the, uh, the orphans or the children of um, non-Indigenous people after the wars. There should be something like that happening. You know, I was so struck by what he said. Um, they're prisoners of war. They're mm. they're they're the result of of what's happened. You know, the lack of housing. You know, the cops pushing down on people. It, you know, it is quite appalling what is happening. But it's not only Alice Springs. I'm from Sydney, actually. Uh, same diff, same thing. So, some sort of legacy, some sort of payout to improve people's lives. Indigenous kids, stolen generation, you know. Thanks. Thank you. I, I was I was struck um, by a parallel um, when when Ray was talking between um, the use and the uh, um, disposal of coloured diggers and the way ethnic minorities are used as soldiers in Ukraine at the moment. That's true. Yeah. Um, that there's a, a, a fairly typical pat pattern of, you know, um, military forces making use of their least valued, um, the least valued people to which they have access to use them as soldiers. Um, yep. And uh, so, yeah, it was just something that I noted as we were talking. Um, as we were listening, yeah. Uh, James, it's uh, Don again, just mm -hmm. uh, wanting to comment on the West Australian government. I mean, we, we've got a dreadful history, uh, almost equal to Queensland, I think. But um, just recently, about a year ago, the WA government passed something called the Southwest Noongar Settlement. And um, it's a... Uh, a huge amount of money being given uh, to uh, that they're setting up six Noongar, what are they calling them? Um, anyway, based on areas, based on language uh, subgroups. Um, I think the first payment to the first corporations, that's right, six corporations. Uh, so they're going, going to have to go through all sorts of um, legal things. Uh, in, in return, uh, I believe they've given up their native title rights. Uh, I'm not sure of the legalities of all of that either, but uh, it's almost a treaty, uh, and um, it's not called that, but uh, there are a couple of lawyers in Canberra who say this is uh, the equivalent of a treaty. Um, and it was something like uh, 60 million was given to the first corporation, uh, last year or early this last year, I think. So uh, th things are changing here. Um, mm. it's, uh, it's a very fluid area of history at the moment. Mm. But possibly still, I mean, uh, Margaret Walters has just observed in the chat that giving up native title doesn't sound good. I mean, we don't know the whole story. I agree. But, uh, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we like, we've been hearing about the need just for reparation, mm. um, and uh, yeah, it's still you know there are still bargains being struck even even amongst all of this. Uh, another but, another mm. doubt area is the uh, that amount of money. I suspect they are uh, the 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 white. If I can just be 
black and white about it, um, but almost the pun. Um, the, the, the government is expecting the corporations to assume the capitalistic system and make a profit and make an income to support themselves and all of that sort of undercurrent as well. It's a complex society we're in. It is. It is a complex society. I've just been looking at who's here and uh, um, I saw um, Jeanette McLeod from Wilf down there, which made me think about there's undoubtedly a very strong um, gender issue um, coming behind everything that we've been discussing as well today, which we didn't really get to. Um, you know, the way women may have been, been treated through all of this is something, is, I'm sure, is something else again. Um, Michelle Smith has just um, made an observation. Negotiation of a treaty is an opportunity for colonial society um, to seek forgiveness. Um, yeah, do you want to say anything more about that, Michelle? Put you on the spot. Oh. No, that's all. I just wanted to raise that opportunity because um, I think from both sides of the treaty process, there's got to be give and take. And um, I, I think seeking forgiveness is a really important thing for the rest of society to, to, um, to deal with. Yeah, it's huge. And it's, I mean, we are on this, you know, remaining on this conversation now, predominantly settlers, you know, making some assumptions here, but uh, it's, it's up to us to do most of the work. It should be. Dot, I see your hand up. You're muted. Hear me now? Yeah. Um, I'm Dot yep. Newland. Uh, I'm on Darig land, um, Western Sydney. Um, I've uh, come, this is, uh, I'm really uh, impressed, you know, and I've learned a lot today from the panelists. I just think it's just so wonderful to, even though tragic, horrible stories, it's just wonderful that people can share them. And I think that the schools should be incorporating them in, in their education classes. And I was thinking from the point of view of education, there is a group at Redfern called um, Attached to the Tribal Warrior. And um, that there are tourist uh, you know, groups going out doing that sort of thing. Um, basically, I thought if, you know, as well as having museums, uh, if there could be more education on a practical way from uh, the people who are living in that area who know the history of Sydney and Sydney Harbour and what and all the things that happened there and, and who can share it. If that could be supported more as well um, for children and for, for you know, it, not just tourists, but for, for everybody. So um, that I just want to contribute that. Thank you for all the input. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dot. Yeah. Peter, I, Peter, I saw your hand up briefly. Was that His hand went up and down. Um, how are we doing? Any other things people want to contribute? We might wind this up fairly soon. Um, there's been a heap of information going through the chat, um, which, is, which has been really great. And uh, um, we can also harvest that and share it around, but you can feel free to also, you can, you can uh, select the text in the chat and copy it if you want to grab all that information for yourself. Um, because there's a whole heap of, of resources that people have been sharing there. Um, James, can you hear me? Yes, Kerry, hello. Yes, I didn't know whether you saw my hand or not. No, I missed your hand, yep. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I'm very moved with the, the program today um, and uh, I would just like to add my two cents worth listening to our wonderful, wonderful speakers. And um, I've... I've uh, been to a number of memorial sites. I've been to Appen, 
I'm in, I'm in Darawal country, so Appen Memorial Service is held every year. And I've also been out to Mile Creek. And, and Professor Reynolds was to come there um, last year and he came in by Zoom because of COVID. And, and, um, and, 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 and Pastor uh, Ray uh, also speaks um, with such um, sorrow. Um, and talking about needing to honour the, the, uh, the massacres and colonial wars in on site or in the locations, in the nations where these things occurred. And out at Mile Creek, um, uh, it, it's, um, it's actually a, a beautiful moving ceremony. And, they, and for the last speaker who just spoke, um, they have four busloads of children get bussed in from outside of the area. And these children are part of the ceremony. They're high school children. They've, they've been, they've learned the history and they actually participate on the walk from where we sit and um, welcome everybody to country. We walk down to uh, a ceremonial site and these beautiful young kids in their uniforms, they're standing on each of the, of the um, particular spots along the way. And you go up there and you stand there and these lovely children tell you about this, this part of the, the story. So it, it's a, a, a very e embracing um, uh, ceremony to go into and to, and, and, uh, and to see it, it's, it's such over many generations are there on site. And what, what the uh, descendants of those that were massacred and the descendants of the offenders, they, they embrace. Mm. And they both speak, and it's a very peaceful sight. Um, and it's a peaceful sight because of the healing that's happened by having these beautiful ceremonies year after year. And the same can be some said by the Appen Memorial site, as I say, I go to that as well. Same situation: the descendants of the of the only woman that, that escaped um, that um, dreadful massacre. Uh, the great great granddaughter welcomes the great great granddaughter of one of the 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 um, uh, offenders, and so that's and again, lot, all the school children come and all the communities invited. So they're they're wonderful places of healing, history, understanding, compassion, and healing. That's what I think we need to move forward. And and like has been said, unless we know the history. We don't know who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to sum, sum that up by saying um, having memorials um, uh, it, on, on site, in, in, lo in location, on, the, on particular country, I think is um, powerful healing uh, because I think the healing has to happen um, on, you know, in the microcosm to move out into the macro. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, James. Uh, thank you, Kerry. And uh, not just micro, but like across all of the Aboriginal countries. Yes. Um, as opposed to just division. our one country. Yeah. Spot on. That's my yeah. point exactly. Yeah. We have to we have to realise that we're still, I don't know, 250 nations. Um, and let's let's honour the individuality of all of those nations. Thanks, James. Cheers. Um, Nick or Weiss, is the uh, the brains behind our subsequent two days. Is there anything that you wanted to say about um, either reflecting on on today or, or them or or, uh, or or where you see the threads go that are going to go through from here? Well, I'm organising day three on Monday, and um, I think the bar is high. <laughs> I hope I can pull this off and. Uh, and introduce and keep the conversation going and that the preparations that we've done, uh, that things will happen well. Uh, so yeah, so stick with us. Uh, Nick will, uh, Nick has organized Sunday afternoon and I've organized Monday afternoon. But after this afternoon, I realized that uh, I will reread my notes and make sure that I, uh, 
I've got it all correctly in place. Uh, it'll be it'll be terrific. Um, we've done it. We've done it all before. Did you want to add something, Nick? You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I've, I've got a radio going in the background, so uh, um, I, I think I'll, I'll stay mute. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we've been chatting for half an hour. Um, which it's been actually very nice to come down a bit that very in, intense conversation and to hear some of the stories about you know things that have been done in Western Australia and the and the uh, memorials and so on and, and some of the opportunities for practical steps is I think very helpful and gives us some energy and ideas for for ways that we can contribute. So um, I think I will. Thank you all for coming. Let us all skip into what is a lovely sunny afternoon out, out here in Sydney so we can um, enjoy that. And uh, yes, for those who are uh, coming along for the next couple of days, we'll see you there. And if you haven't registered, go and register. Thank you all.